Hi, everybody. Uh, well, for the last part of our bioinformatics practical, we have a one-hour session on biological pathways and networks. Um, as you can see, there's a fair bit of text that I've, uh, I've added at the header here to kind of contextualize the, the exercises that we're going through. Um, as we slide down, we learn a little bit more about gene ontology, classifying by biological process, molecular function, and cellular uh, location, cellular components, sorry. Um, so we're, we were going to start with an assessment of gene ontology, not on the gene ontology website itself, but rather in the WebGestalt interface. So uh, the interface can be found by just going to webgestalt.org, as you can see. Um, I want to point out that in this case, the, the authors of this system created this website initially while they were working at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And then for 10 years, the uh, lead maintainer on it uh, was a professor at Vanderbilt like me. Um, but then at the, about the same time I left, uh, he went down to, uh, to work at Baylor College of Medicine. But that software has not been impeded, its use has been, not been impeded by all these moves. Because the, uh, they chose a URL that is specific to the tool that has just followed them around and they've been able to continue working on it, regardless of which university they're at. So uh, that's a, a helpful example. You can also see that in the introduction to the website, it specifies that this is now WebGestalt 2019, uh, a new release. After two years um, operating with the 2017 release, they updated substantially to include new tools in 2019. Okay, uh, so we are going to use a list of human genes that were included from a transcriptomic signature for tuberculosis infection rates produced in the Ogara laboratory. Uh, we're going to start, of course, with Web WebGestalt. Um, we need to specify that the organism we're working oh, goodness me, that the organism we're working with is human. So we can pull down on this. Um, is this every species? Certainly not. Um, in fact, M tuberculosis is not on this list. So that would be problematic for people who wanted to use WebGestalt um, with those terms. But the same kinds of um, the same kinds of procedures would apply whether you're dealing with keg um, keg maps for MTB or gene ontology for human. The, the same kinds of functions are available in both. In this case, we are working with a Homo sapiens data set. So when we clicked over to that, method of interest popped up. We want to specify that we're going to do an over-representation over enrichment analysis. So we can come to the method of interest and specify over-representation enrichment analysis. All right. Uh, we're going to use gene ontology, which is the database. But remember, there are three different forks inside this. We're going to specify that we want molecular functions. So um, we specify a gene ontology set. And within that, we need to specify molecular function. We actually have the option of going um, redundant or non-redundant. I think at the time I made this demo, there was not a distinction between those. So we'll simply use molecular function as written here. All right. Now, as you remember, there's a lot of translating that needs to be done when you provide a list of um, probe identifiers uh, or uh, or gene identifiers or whatever. So we need to specify what kinds of gene IDs we're going to give. In this case, we want Illumina Human WG 6 version 3. So Illumina Human WG. All right, so let's, uh, let's go through this. Uh, can we find the Illumina set? I scroll, I scroll, I scroll. Here we go. Looking good. All right, and I see Illumina Human 6v3. That might look good. But is that what we wrote in the directions? It is subtly different. We wanted the human WG 6 version 3, correct? All right, I'm going to select those. Did you notice there was a little tooltip there? I'm going to pull that back open. I'm going to pull that back open. Okay, so as I hover here, did you see what happened in the tooltip? We see that it's got ILMN underscore blah, blah, blah. So if you have gene IDs that don't look like that, it would be a good hint that you're on the wrong identifier. So just to, just for uh, giggles, I'm going to suggest that we open this input file that we're going to feed it. It was the Ogera signature, right? Do, 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 do. All right, I'm going to just drag that into Internet Explorer. Oh, that's awfully small. I'm going to, I'm going to make the font really monstrously big. 
So would you say that that's a pretty good agreement between the formatting that the tooltip suggested and the formatting that we have here? It's not a bad starting, starting place. Okay. Oop, I don't want to pause anything. I want to just continue on. All right, great. So we followed the, the directions pretty well, but we now must open the file and specify... Uh, we, we need to specify that these are the IDs to read. So we're going to click on Choose File. And now we have to navigate to where those files are stored, which on my laptop is a few directories down. So into there, into own cloud, into docs, into archives, into course descriptions, do, 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 down to Sun Honors Bioinformatics Practical, and finally, this is going to be different for you because you've put them in a more sensible location than this very long path, but uh, okay. So now I've told it to use that file. Magic happens. Uh, and now I need to specify a reference gene set. Um, this is going to be just the same as it was before. The Illumina Human Genome WG6V3. I think that's the right one, isn't it? It's got the WG on it. All right, grand. Okay, oh, that's just within the directions there. Okay, so in effect, we have uh, we've provided it a how are you to translate these these this assay into gene symbols. That's what this Illumina Human Work Working Group Six Version Three is, and then this one down here specifies that these differences should be considered against the whole genome, in effect. You could provide another list to say, these are all the genes we detected, and, th and specify that the o Ogera set are just the differences. But in this case, we're going to simply say, we sampled the whole genome, so we're using the whole genome as our expectation of which ones we, we saw. So this and this, the gene ID type and the reference set, are actually playing different roles here. Okay. Um, right, next we're going to click the Submit button, and this process will start. We're not going to mess with the advanced parameters. As, as I said, when we, uh, when we work with a web server, we really should notify them that we're about to have 20 people click the Submit button all at the same time. But hopefully the server will keep up with us. Did somebody already get a response? Wonderful! Great, well then I don't have to wait too long. In the meanwhile, you get this helpful, when they know they're, they've got your attention because you're waiting for your analysis to finish, they specify not only the, the list, of, the, the Hall of Fame, you know, who are the developers and, and engineers and, and scientists who created this, but also who funded them. That's a pretty good thing when you're trying to show that you have uh, practical accomplishments uh, from your grant money. Mm -hmm. So what is overrepresentation analysis? Who would like to give us a quick, let's say one minute, on what overrepresentation analysis is all about? Does somebody want to take a shot at it? We talked about overrepresentation analysis earlier. That was uh, the slide that had the equation on it, I guess. Might be the simplest way to bring your memory back to it. Remember, we were computing a probability that we would see exactly this many genes overlapping, or more, right? So you compute the probability for the number of genes that you did have any overlap, the probability for that number of genes plus one, up to the maximum possible value. At the teach back session that the, the Sam Sampson will be leading, um, you, you will be responsible for teaching some of the content from your advanced course to the students in the other advanced course. So I hope that you will uh, that you will take the chance to practice with other people in the class beforehand so you know what it feels like to stand in front of somebody and try to teach a complex concept. That will be very valuable to you when the moment arrives where you're standing in front of everybody doing it. Was it comfortable, Reese, when I put you on the spot like that? <laughs> All right. Well, it's public speaking is not something that we emphasize as much as we really should in science because it's a very necessary tactic for all of us to communicate ourselves to other people, to explain why my work matters. You know, that's part and parcel of uh, publicity for us. 
Are other people getting responses from the server? Oh, that's good news. No, not for you. Okay. I'm going to say we've got 30% waiting then. I submitted one to join the party and then Oh, that's rough. Okay. Well, it is kinder when we're not all hitting the submit button at the same time. So that, that's fun. Uh, Janine, I'm going to put you on the spot for just a moment. I, I would like you to tell me one salient fact about overrepresentation analysis. What is it for? What's the what's the goal, for example? To ensure that it's not overrepresented in the stuff that we have and allow this even I, I think I would state it the opposite way actually. Our our goal is to check to determine um, do we have an overrepresentation of genes sure in this particular Out of all the different pathways that might be used to explain our genes, which ones have this the most significant collision, really, with the uh, with the pathways in, in question? Okay, that, that's good for a purpose. Do you have something you'd add? Another, another second point. Not one. silent when I ask that. All right, well, I, I just think that it's, it's valuable. Here we are doing an overrepresentation analysis. It would be kind of nice to know why. When we looked at the, uh, when we looked at the gene probe list, was it long? It's pretty big, right? If, if you as a graduate student were given a list like this to say, these assay probes showed themselves to be differential in this study. What would you make of that? You might look at it and just sort of shrug your shoulders and say, what am I supposed to do with this? Right? So one of the, the first things you would want to do is exactly the same as the first thing what we saw was doing, which is to say, which genes do these, um, do these array probes map to? Right? I mean, something like, ILMN 1909-770 uh, uh, is not that informative to us, but if you know what gene symbol it maps to, you're in a, a better spot. All right, I, I see that mine is still running here. That's uh, disorienting. But uh, I believe you said that you're finished, right? Okay. Could, could you tell us um, how how well did the software do in making sense of these Illumina identifiers? Does it have some information on the page? <laughs> it does have some information of that sort. So she, she has just put forward a rule for us, a majority. 
So you, you, you've taken the perspective that if at least half are mapped, then we feel like it's working OK. Is that a strong enough rule? OK, you want more than half. OK. So in this case, have we beaten the 90% barrier? Shall we look at the numbers again? Yeah. OK, the, the numbers are out of 407, 373 were unambiguously mapped. OK, so uh, 400 minus 73 is 27. Add some to that, 34. That's 91%. 91%. Okay, so close enough for research work? All right, so in general, we beat 90%, which means that 10% of our data are being tossed. That's, that's a little frustrating for us, and it may be that there's another mapping that is better to use for this type of microarray. So that's, that's a possibility. <coughs> but there's more reduction going on here. Out of the 373 user IDs, I really, you know, I'm going to just go punch this button again because this is really disappointing. <laughs> I'm going to close that tab. I'm going to redo the submit here. Just kills me that's not done on the projecting computer. All right, so we have 373 user IDs are unambiguously mapped to 301 unique entree gene IDs. What does that mean? Why does 373 become 301? All right, what were the numbers that we fed in in the first place? Like, what are all those IL and N numbers? Gene, gene what? Somebody say the P word here. Probes. This was done on a microarray. So what we have is that each address on that microarray has a gene probe number. But as we mentioned in the microarray section, multiple probes may be produced for each gene. Like what if you have multiple probes that are specific to different transcripts, right? So there's some amount of shrinkage going on that we had differential gene probes. I'm still going to just run it. I don't know what I can do about that. So we, we see in this case that we had different gene probes that amounted to 301 different genes themselves. Right? So we have multiple probes that map to a particular genes. All fine and good. All right. Uh, and so the, all, all the subsequent analysis is going to be based on 301 genes that have been declared differential or interesting in this case. Grant. All right. And in this case, we are mapping to all of the different gene probes, or the, the mapping of all the gene probes um, to uh, that, that come across the entire microarray. All right, which in, in turn includes thirty three thousand six hundred eighty five different genes. Okay. Now I'm going to return to the uh, directions since the web server is I've probably just done a massive denial of service attack on it and it's not going to respond to anything else. We'll just see. All right. So. How well was it able to interpret our gene probes to gene symbols? We lost about 10% of them. So there might be a better mapping, but there might not be. All right, we next want to see a Go Slim summary. A Go Slim summary. Um, I'm going to come back to your laptop again. All right, so we're looking at enrichment results. Have they changed the interface so much that Go Slim summaries are no longer here? <laughs> That's the low job summary. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Go Slim Summary for the User Uploaded IDs. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. So on her screen, we have, this is just not going to behave itself, is it? I am so sorry about that. OK. Um, I'm going to pick this up for a moment. I'll try not to drop my laptop. It's a nice, nice little window. All right. So you see three bar charts. All right. These three bar charts are representing the tripartite nature. Did you get to catch the word tripartite? It can sound very educated to use big words. But tripartite just means three parts. The three part structure of gene ontology. Does anyone remember the three, uh, the three parts of gene ontology? No? Why you? I don't know why. I'm just looking over there. Chris. No, I'm sorry. I'm thinking maybe try running with the core. Firefox, because Firefox works on my computer in Chrome and Edge, and this works in Firefox. Before you do that, just try and run it again, because I ran mine two thumbs down, the last time I ran it didn't work. So don't go back and make it and submit it, because it's oh, literally 
Yeah, yeah I, I, I did rerun it. I did it twice as well. We'll see what we can do. Been a while since I did anything in Firefox. Come on, web gestalt. All right. We'll try Firefox, see what happens. Well, I just showed you three bar graphs, but I haven't heard a compelling reason why. Why did I get back three bar graphs when I asked for a Go Slim summary? The three parts of gene ontology. Excellent, excellent. All right. Which one? We did molecular function here. These were Illumina, blah, 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 blah. Human working group. I'm going to browse back to O'Gara again. Oh, my goodness. It's so far to get there. This PC, I want to drop down to local disk. Uncloud, documents, sun, courses. Oh, not that one. I wanted this one. All right. The practical O'Gara signature. It's uploading. Need to specify this. Do you think it's going to be zippy this time? Yes. But we hold thumbs, right? We hold thumbs. Do people actually do this gesture when they say holding thumbs? Do you hold a thumb this way? What is it? That's holding thumbs? Oh, that's interesting. Ah, so much better. Look at this. All right, so our job summary showed probe IDs, of which 373 mapped, mapping to 301 genes. Great. So yes, Firefox was the very helpful for us in this case. If we look at the Go Slim summary, we get back these three plots. So we can see that um, we're not using all of the Go categories here. The, the number of Go categories in each of these hierarchies is a very, very large number. Instead, it's just going down to a one level of, uh, of complexity. So we have biological reg regulation, response to stimulus, metabolic process, cell communication, etc. Great. And it's also doing something that I would call a Pareto sort, which is to say it's going from the most common category to the least common category. But you note there's kind of a difference in that last bar. Unclassified to say um, which, which genes don't hit any of these, these categories. Great. So, but that hasn't answered the question. I'm, I'm going to just close this other browser because it's really vexing me that it's just chewing away. Uh, we're going to now ask what is the biological process, molecular function, and cellular component that features the most entries on this transcript list? All right. So if we pop back to this, I can come down to my overrepresentation analysis, which is right here. You can see that it has different levels of redundancy reduction. Um, this means that when you have a set of genes, a, a pathway, that is enriched for a particular uh, that is enriched on a particular list of interesting genes. Um, it's frequently the case that different levels of the hierarchy, such as a subset of this gene set, will also be um, will also get a significant p-value uh, if this one does. So um, the software tries to reduce out that redundancy uh, to give you a, uh, a a more minimal list of the of the, the pathways that are uh, that have really large numbers of genes on your list. So if we look at the bar chart, we see that IgG binding, immunoglobulin binding, et cetera, have a really, really high enrichment ratio. The, the number of uh, genes that were observed versus those that were um, 
that would be expected by random chances is much greater for things like IgG bond, uh, binding and immunoglobulin binding. Okay. What happens if you change this to say weighted set cover? Does it change which categories appear? It does. Did you notice that the list got shorter? So here we started with all of the all of the gene sets that had significant uh, values that came back from overrepresentation analysis. But you can see that IgG binding and immunoglobulin binding are quite strongly related to each other. I believe one falls below the next in the uh, uh, in the pathway. You could even go to the directed acyclic graph approach to see how these relate to each other. You see IgG binding is a subgroup of immunoglobulin binding. So it's not surprising that both of these would give significant p-values because they contain overlapping sets of genes. So when we come back to our bar chart, if we want to use something like weighted set cover, it says, well, you know, those two are actually related to each other. I shouldn't show both, just the one that has the the, the better uh, the better probability associated with it. Okay? Great. Uh, so let me now return to this. Using the tabs at the top, select the enrichment results. I think this has actually changed in the, the newest edition of the software. Which gene ontology entities were found to be disproportionately represented in the set of differential genes? Well, this is essentially the, the question that we started with. So if I click on individual bars up here, this is just telling me all of the different, uh, all of the different pathways that had uh, uh, disproportionate numbers of genes associated with them. If I actually click on one, it's going to give me the counts that are associated with it. That uh, out of the 274 genes that we called um, that we called um, interesting in this case, that were on the O'Gara uh, text file, seven of them overlapped with this gene set, double-stranded RNA binding, uh, that contained a total of 73 genes in it. So this is, uh, this is valuable for us to be able to see, uh, to dissect why, uh, why one of these pathways was selected as being overrepresented within the gene list. OK, grand. Now uh, next, let's try a look at KEG. KEG. So KEG is a really valuable resource, but it tends to have an awful lot of hand annotation to it. Okay, so this is KEG. Um, in the, uh, we're looking at KEG2, I guess, but in this case, I wanted to try a look at what KEG could tell us about molecular pathways associated with tuberculosis. So I can simply come in here and type the word tuberculosis and go. Great, lots of feedback uh, came from that. In this case, I wanted to see a KEG pathway. So map 05152 is the only hit that we had within KEG pathway. You see individual genes are, are listed here. These are ones that show up somewhere. But we wanted to see the map associated with tuberculosis. It's kind of weird, right? We don't think of uh, tuberculosis as a genetic disease, do we? It's an infectious disease. So why does it have a pathway here? Because a lot of the molecular interactions of tuberculosis uh, with with various gene products is, has has become available to us. All right, um, I have kind of a tricky question for this next piece. I'm I'm going to click on the map so it's up nice and big on screen. Okay, so you can see I can scroll around on it a little bit and and so on. My my first kind of evil question asks: Is this drawn by a computer or is it drawn by a person? The lines are straight. Okay, so a person obviously worked on a computer to make this, yes, at the, at the very best. I was not suggesting that they freehanded this. <laughs> okay, so yes, um, the, there are lines that have been drawn here. Was this drawn by a computer being told this links to this and that links to the other and show me how that all renders out? Not really. Not really. This is a, this is a case where a lot of human intuition has been put into these relationships among all these different genes and gene products. Grand. Let us, uh, let's continue on here. Macrophages ingesting M. tuberculosis are part of the infection process. Would we, would we agree with that statement? 
I claimed it. Does that hold up? What's a macrophage? The immune system's Pac-Man, you know. All right, so it's, right, so in, in this case, macrophages ingest mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria. They attempt to engulf them and kill them, but the, the mycobacterium tuberculosis is able to evade that and instead infect the macrophage. All right, so how is, how is that stage reflected on this graph? Oops. I can roll around on a little bit. What have we got over here? Okay, I, actually what I'm showing on screen is all I need to show to answer this question. The text is kind of smallish. What is the, the big gray shaded box at the left labeled? That, that is the pathogen itself. That is the mycobacterium tuberculosis. We can see it's got elements of the cell wall here, the peptidoglycan and so on, right? And then what is the what is the uh, the name on the other part? Right. So they've drawn very very largely a bug at the left getting engulfed by the macrophage on the right. Okay. So they're they're telling the same story that will start any number of seminars that you will see here in this department. Uh, now, uh, if we if we are to look around this in more detail. You will see a lot of genes that show up for a lot of people. Um, when you're watching a student's talk on the uh, coming out of the immunology group, they may be talking about uh, toll-like receptors, for example. You can see that those are included in this figure as well. Um, the ESAT6 uh, is a, a popular kind of a membrane transport system, I think, uh, within these cells. So a, a lot of times when you're pressed into listening uh, to a lecture on somebody who's working in a disease different than you, you're going to need to sort of familiarize yourself in a hurry with the, the genes that they're talking about. This is a very good way to do it because as comprehensively as possible, they've listed every gene that is known to have an effect in this uh, interaction between macrophages and tuberculosis. Okay, so uh, to return to our directions, uh, we wanted to look at a process called lysine biosynthesis. Lysine biosynthesis. So in this case, we are going to um, we're going to manufacture some lysine through this process of lysine biosynthesis. All pretty straightforward there. Let us click on go, and again we get uh, well in this case two different pathways back. I believe I specified map number three hundred, but let me check my directions here. Yeah, which map number? Okay, this time we have numbers in the boxes rather than gene accessions. Well, this one's a little simpler, isn't it? We don't have, you know, hundreds of genes represented. We have, you know, maybe dozens. So you remember earlier we were looking at an example based on caffeine, and we had genes that were able to synthesize caffeine and others that were able to synthesize something else from it. In the same way, we can see that uh, we have kind of our star right here because this is the lysine biosynthesis pathway, and we see that there are three different routes in, right? You could have meso-2,6-diaminopimylate as an input that leads through this pipeline to L-lysine. You could have L-saccharopine, uh, I don't know, pine? <laughs> All right, that could go this way. You could be starting with lysine W gamma L-lysine, um, which can feed in this way as well. But remember, I, I mentioned these uh, dotted values, these, these numbers traced in alongside these paths. This reflects the fact that lysine biosynthesis can be done, it can be performed in lots of different species, and they have shared mechanisms for getting there. And in this case, the enzyme commission numbers, the EC numbers that appear in these boxes, 1416, if I hover over that, we see that it's got a, it's, it's DAPDH. Um, we can get more information by clicking around on these things. These are live maps. So that we, we see that enzyme commission numbers here help us to understand that this particular reaction with this input and that output is, uh, is, catabola is uh, catalyzed by this particular enzyme. Grand. So lots of information here. Uh, okay, 
I wanted to continue on. What EC number corresponds to the pathway between meso 26 diamino pimylate and L-lysine? Pimylate is kind of fun to say for some reason. I'm not sure why. All right. So we've got what number? Which number relates to that? How do we get from diamino pimylate? There it is. 41120. I think I heard someone say that. Can we click it? Let's click it, see what happens. It's thinking about it. All right. Remember, we were starting with pimylate and we were outputting lysine. If we click on the EC number, we get the definition of EC41120. It is a diaminopimylate decarboxylase. So what do you think a, a decarboxylase does to diaminopimylate in this case? <laughs> it removes the carboxyl group. Very good. Right, so this, this systematic name for this enzyme can be used in lots of different species. I, I believe you'd even be able to find specific instances of it if you, uh, if you rolled down. Um, but I, I, I want you to have that... Um, uh, I want you to have those, those numbers in mind. There are other lookup services we can also use, such as the one at XPASI. So 41120, this is not just a keg thing, right? Keg is just using a, an existing standard for this. So our number was what? Four? One? One? Twenty. All right, if I run the search, I see DAP decarboxylase. Grant. Now look at all these hits that we have to it. Does everyone remember Uniprot Knowledge Base? It's one of the best protein databases out there. And here we see that we've got hits to Arath. Does anyone recognize what that name could be coming from? Arath. This is actually a genus and species, species name abbreviated and slammed together. The first three letters are the name of the genus. Ab absolutely, yeah. Arabidopsis thaliana. This is one of the most widely studied plants. Well done, well done. Anyone recognize some of the others? Okay, I, I, I hope you spotted the E. coli and said, ah, that must be that, that gene in E. coli. <laughs> Methanococcus genasii. If you're into thermophiles, they made it onto the list. Um, Streptococcus. Ah, I don't actually know what that is. Uh, if I open the link, it should pop directly to the Uniprod entry. Oh, that is from Streptomyces co coeli color. All right, well, in any case, I, I, I want you to think about something really remarkable that this is showing us about the evolution of life on this planet. Everybody manufactures lysine at some point. Every, every creature out there has well, a great, great many of them make use of this functionality. And here we're getting a list of all these different sequences that relate to the same functionality. So you could, for example, throw all of these sequences in one hopper and try to do a, a Clustal W run on it, uh, multiple sequence alignment, to show which parts of these protein sequences have been conserved over time so strongly that you can see a resemblance in sequence from an E. coli to a plant to a human. Shocking. All right. Okay. I have given myself uh, only another 15 minutes for discussion. Um, I'm going to jump to this last thing because I think it's really useful. It is often the case that I will run across a student who is making a poster or making a talk for something and they have a whole bunch of different bubbles that they need to connect together in PowerPoint. And they end up spending a whole afternoon working with alignment and grouping and arrow dragging and pulling anchors around when they really could benefit quite a lot from a tool that will automate the, uh, this, this assembly of images for them. So I want to teach you about some software that I really love called GraphViz that lets me do an awful lot of tricks. You've seen any number of images from me already that have been automatically generated through GraphViz, rather than my spending hours and hours trying to hook together bubbles on PowerPoint, which would frankly drive me mad. 
So um, graph visualization is a really powerful capability. I, I really should be spending this time showing you Cytoscape. I, I will tell you at least one story about Cytoscape. I will mention uh, that before I've told you that many people in graduate school run into people around them that they just that, that fill them with terror that I, could, I may not be good enough for what I'm doing. When I showed up at grad school, uh, it was the first time that the Department of Molecular Biotechnology had brought students in from the outside world. And before that, they'd always uh, recruited their students out of uh, places like genetics and biomedical engineering and so on. Uh, so the department was growing, and for the first time, they were recruiting students of their very own from the outside world. So I was really pleased to be invited to uh, come be a doctoral student with them. It was thrilling. Um, but the other guy that they brought in at the same year was coming not out of an undergrad program like mine at a state university, but rather from a really elite school. Have most people heard of MIT? He just finished his master's degree at MIT. And here's Dave, who just finished his undergraduate, his bachelor degree at Arkansas, and both of us are equally first-year uh, PhD students. Trey had a lot, of, uh, a lot of clear notions about what it was he wanted to do with his career. And he was off to the races from the word go. I remember I was trying to put the finishing touches on my, uh, my software project for the sequence alignment class. And he was completely done with his semester project by that time. Very, very sharp guy, very driven and uh, thoughtful guy. Well, so in the, in the aftermath of uh, graduating from the department, which I think he did in four years and I did in seven, um, Trey went off to become a professor at San Diego. Uh, and the tool that he created uh, as, uh, as kind of his first big push as a professor um, was uh, known by the name Cytoscape. So the guy I went to grad school with is the creator of this, this, uh, this tool that is kind of at the center of how everybody visualizes network biology data. I just want to point out that everybody has this experience of running into somebody who's a bigger fish than they are. It doesn't mean that you're, you don't also belong there, but obviously I found a somewhat different path to my career than Trey found to his. And that is okay. We are all capable of doing the things that we're capable of doing. Sorry, I just had to tell you that brief, brief story. All right. You, so others have felt that way too. No, no, no. I'm saying that was like a lot easier. Yeah, oh, good, good. Yeah. All right. So we are going to use webgraphviz.com. It is a handy dandy user interface for doing rendering of this sort. You can see that they start you with a, a little bit of code uh, to begin with. It's still loading. Ah, oh, there it's done. Okay. So I would point out a, a, a bit of uh, a bit of language here. You see how this is labeled at? Oh, it's um, not showing you the edge on, up there. If you're looking at this on your laptop, you will see that the first line of this graph reads digraph G, and then a curly brace that opens, and that matches with another curly brace at the bottom. So it is saying that this is a directional graph. A directional graph means that the edges have a directionality associated with them. One is where you're coming from, one is where you're going to. In the graph is language, it's specifying uh, that this object here called welcome points to an object called to. Similarly, the object to points to web. Web, in turn, points to, uh, 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 sorry, the to also points to graph is. Do we see that? So if we click on generate graph, we'll see that immediately, down at the bottom, the corresponding graph has been generated. Now, I, I do this on my desktop with the command line version, but it, the output is exactly the same. It runs dot on that script up there, it outputs an image, and the image appears down below. Okay, so that's, that's lovely. Uh, there are some more complex examples here as well. I believe the one I specified was sample four. So I'm going to click on sample four instead. So we have a, a bit more complexity going on with the code in this one. I'm going to zoom this up a little larger if you don't mind. Uh, okay, so here we are creating a graph that has been named, that is called finite state machine. These graphs, these names do not actually appear in the graph, so you can name it, I hate this graph, and it'll still work. So that's completely allowable, and in fact, it's long-standing tradition to do such things. 
Most of my graphs are, are originally exported under the name junk. Okay, so uh, here we have a rank direction. It's specifying that when things are above others, they should appear to their left. So instead of having a, a top bottom graph, a TV graph, it's doing a left right graph where parents are on the left and children are on the right. Size, 8 comma 5 here is just specifying uh, the type of uh, pane on which we're drawing. And you see that it has a node definition, a node definition. So when we're, oh, that hand. So if we are, uh, if we're doing a, uh, anything in graphs, it's worth knowing that we have objects and the, the things that connect them, the arrows that connect them, right? So nodes are the things that we're connecting. Edges are the things that run between them. So here we are specifying that we have nodes that are double circles. So anything that's defined under this node definition is going to show up with a double boundary around it. We see that four objects are, are created after that. LR0, LR3, LR4, and LR8. Those can be anything. That could be, you know, Biff, George, Sandy, and, and Carl. Then we have another node definition. And this time, uh, there's nothing specified after it. So that could be a little confusing. Just remember that when you create a node, it's going to be visualized according to whatever definition preceded it. So LR0, 3, 4, and 8 all get double circles. Anything created after the second line, however, gets only a single circle. Then we specify 0 points to 2, and we note that we've added a label this time. So it's not enough. In this case, we didn't have, we weren't limiting ourselves to say we wanted an arrow between these things. We can also put a label on that edge. All right, so down here at the bottom, when we click, click on Generate Graph, we actually get a pretty complex structure out of here. I'm going to zoom that back a little bit. So you can remember that we created LR0, 3, 4, and 8 after the double circle command. But all the other ones in here, numbers 1, 2, 6, 5, and 7, those were all created um, after the single circle. You can easily imagine if you were sitting down with PowerPoint trying to work out how these things all connected to each other, you might struggle for a little bit to figure out, well, what do I need to put where in order to get this all to fit on the slide? In this case, the software is doing automatic layout. And it's quite clear which things are the, uh, the top of the graph, the left of the graph in this case, which things are the children of that, which things are two children down. You can see that the software is keeping this, um, this level of hierarchy uh, consistent. So these items are all two edges away from the parent node over here. And the software is keeping all of them on that same horizontal level in order to accomplish that. So when I create images that talk about all the different algorithms that are existing in bioinformatics, I'm, I'm generating them in this way, specifying which, uh, which nodes connect to which nodes, and the software generates the layout for me. Very handy bit of software. So this is, uh, this is particularly value, valuable when you have uh, networks of genes that are all interacting with each other, or you have multiple sequential steps, as, as you would in a pathway. Uh, so very handy piece of software. All right. Right, now I, I always like a bit of color in my images. Uh, so you can see that I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to cheat just a little bit. I'm going to add some color into this image. There's a uh, there's a line in Empire Strikes Back when uh, when Han Solo is is frustrated with three PO. He spends pretty much the entire movie frustrated with C three PO the robot. And he shouts, uh, "Hurry up, Goldenrod! If you stay here any longer, you're going to become a permanent resident." And threatening to just leave the leave the guy behind. So using a, a Goldenrod color always reminds me of Star Wars, which is happy. So uh, all right, now I was going to put that before the LR zero. Let me see, before the line adding a link to LR0. So we're going to just paste this guy in here, right there after the shape circle business. You can see that I'm overwriting parts of this definition. We started with a circle design, but shape is being changed from circle to box. The style is being changed to bold and filled. The color is being changed to goldenrod, and the fill color is pale goldenrod. So this time when I click on the generate graph, 
I see that all of those boxes that got created are now uh, put in this new style rather than in the old. So you can make changes to things like this pretty readily. And of course, if you're, uh, if you're trying to make this graph for your own talk, you can generate it on this website and simply right click this and save it off on, save it on your desktop. I don't want to create a print though just now. Okay. Well, uh, that brings us to three minutes before the hour. I just want to say it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed talking with you all. Um, I will, I will make sure everybody uh, gets access to the quiz through the office tomorrow. Uh, Jennifer Jackson knows about it, so um, so we're going to have this fifth quiz. Everybody do really, really well. I've tried to give you every clue I can about what's going to be on it <laughs> by my script, uh, and I think that you'll all do really well on it, and then you can have a, a nice positive takeaway uh, on your grades as well from being part of the bioinformatics class. I will try to find uh, some special prizes for the people who have done best on all of the quizzes. Um, I, I think that's worth celebrating. It's it's hard dealing with a, a, a sneaky person on, on multiple choice. And you've done really well, I think, to, uh, to field my questions. So thank you very much. And I will look forward to working with you as your careers move forward. Thanks. <laughs>